Today, September 18th, marked the date that many investors, many in the financial markets and real estate in all things in terms of credit and lending have been waiting for. It's the date today that Jerome Powell, Federal Reserve Chairman, came forth at the FOMC meeting to designate how much of a federal funds rate cut that they were putting into place today and then what may ensue in the next months ahead and actually even into 2025. So the bets were 25 basis points, which would be 25% or a 50% basis point, 50% um, drop. And some people even pushed for 75 basis points, which would be a pretty hefty move at this point in the market cycle. Well, it came out at 50 basis points, kind of in the middle of what some of the expectations were on both sides. What does that mean exactly? Some people are exuberant about a drop in interest rates. Well, why? Well, with the Fed going to bat against inflation in the last 12, 18, 20 months, raising interest rates at the fastest rate of rise that we've seen in history, going from next to zero all the way to 5.25, 5.5%, 5 500 basis points up in a matter of 18 months, fastest rate rise ever has certainly caused a lot of sluggishness to the economy. Well, that was their point. They wanted to slow down inflation, which was stimulated by all the trillions of dollars that was injected into the economy because of COVID. I mean, these things have ramifications. We all know that. And the government, Federal Reserve, are always kind of playing back and forth the seesaw of how to try to keep things on even keel. I don't know how you do that. And I think they're running out of gas and their ability to do those things because why? The biggest elephant in the room outside of interest rates and the general economy, which I think we're going to in a recession, I think we're in a recession, the biggest elephant in the room today is the debt and the fiscal deficit spending that's adding to our national debt by leaps and bounds. If you haven't been paying attention, we're well over $35 trillion in national, de national debt that's on the balance sheet. I mean, it's way over that in unfunded liabilities, but just on the balance sheet, over $35 trillion. The deficit spending the overage that our government spends, overage beyond what we, they take in from, from revenues, from taxpayers, the overage is hitting $2 trillion this fiscal year, meaning the fiscal year ends in October. We're, we're pressing $2 trillion. That gets added to the $35 trillion because we're not taking enough revenue. Well, it's not that we're not taking enough revenue, it's we're spending too much money. Uh, that's always been a problem of government. But again, back to the interest rates, where does this take us? Well, I think for a lot of the marketplace, which is based on behavioral psychology, a lot of people think, well, lowering interest rates is only going to make things better. It's going to juice the economy and it's going to juice the stock market. It's going to juice real estate. It's going to add fuel to the fire. And that's what everybody thinks we want. Well, the, the people that are counting on the election being in their favor want that because they don't want a recession in front of the election coming up in a couple months. Business owners want lower interest rates because they have to borrow money. Uh, investors who borrow money to buy assets, they want lower interest rates. But we're talking about the short term end of the spectrum. The Federal Reserve does not deal with, or does not have any magnitude or coverage over the long term rates. The 10 year bond, the 30 year mortgage rate doesn't have any relevance there. So on a short term basis, really, it's really psych psychology, in my opinion. There are some people, and it will probably add fervor to the markets on a short-term basis, maybe to push the stock market and the NASDAQ and the S&P, the Dow up a little bit higher for the next couple of months. It could give a short-term breath of air to some of the real estate market. Uh, but on a long-term basis, most people are not going to be affected in a positive way. In fact, the issue with rising asset classes, the bubbles that we've had in the come out of the great financial crisis almost 15 years ago, pushed even higher by the COVID stimulation and all the, the money and the credit expansion to the tune of trillions of dollars, all of that has pushed asset prices up. And if you're an investor and you hold assets, which could be your business, could be stocks, could be real estate, could be precious metals, certain commodities, those tend to do well when, when there's bubbles, when there's a bull market. And this has been fed heavily by fiscal and monetary policy, not by the actual productivity of the country. And that's where the problem comes in. We based our economy on debt. And you know, in your own family, you can only run so far 
when you're running up your credit card bills. You may look good on the, on the surface. You may drive the better car, live in the better, bigger house. You may take some nice vacations. But if you're stacking your li living standard on debt, you know eventually it runs out. The U.S. has gotten away with this for the last number of decades because we have the reserve currency of the world established back in 1944. The cycles in history show that every time there's a dominating superpower in the world, we've gone through multiples of this over the years. We went from the Dutch to the English uh, to now the U.S. We're cycling. I'm not saying it's over in a period of a few years, but we're on the down, downturn. What we have to do today, I believe, is be more in touch with how we are navigating these market dynamics, the geopolitical concerns that are rising daily, the debt cycle that our country is in, interest rates up, down, the market cycle. Where do we put our future? Do we put it in the hands of the old models, putting it with money managers, financial advisors, index funds, ETFs, which maybe had a place in some part of a person's portfolio, or maybe some place still today to some extent. But I think overall, the future lies with those who are willing to be on the forefront of taking control of their own financial efficacy. Yes, it takes work to do that. It takes building acumen and education outside of one's chosen profession or career, but it can be done. I've done it, many others have done it, and today you can do it faster and better and, and really collapse time in doing that if you don't try to do it by yourself. You can read books, you can be smart as a whip, but if you try to build the model yourself when other people have already built it, I think you're gonna pay a, a long, hard price for that. And that's something that I don't think we have enough time to do in most of our lives. We're not 20 years old anymore, we're not 30. Most of us are in our 40s, 50s, 60s, maybe 70s, and we have to be really cognizant of the fact that we have to be more in touch with our money, being stewards of that money, shepherding it forward, and navigating these cycles. There are always opportunities when there's chaos, always opportunities, but you have to be in the mix in order to find those opportunities. I think the federal funds rate going down 50 basis points today, possibly another 50 basis points by the end of the year, We'll see where that lands, but I think the Fed's out of gas. I think they're going to ramp back up inflation and cause a lot of distress in the marketplace. And I think when that happens, you can throw all this hopeism out the door. And it's going to come down to what are you doing in your own personal economy?